Well, we have been in a series about spiritual power, uh, and I just noticed that a bunch of our teens, we've trained them well, have gone out to be uh, with our, our uh, we normally have a time for teens, but that person isn't here this morning. Oh, there they're coming back. So I apologize, guys. We should have said something about that uh, to you before it all got, got started. For whatever reason, uh, the person that normally is there uh, isn't there. So I hate to say it, but you're stuck with me. So that's it. I apologize. We've been in this series, The Power, a Spiritual Power of the Holy Spirit at Work Within You. Uh, and last week, we kind of kicked it off with Pentecost, which is always a, a, a fun time. We kind of talked about the importance of some of those symbols, uh, as well as the phenomena, the fact that, that wind represented, uh, in, in both Greek and Hebrew, the word for wind is, can mean wind, and it can mean uh, uh, breath, and it can mean spirit, right? So, so it symbolizes the fact that God is breathing life into his people again. It's kind of a, a, a redo of Genesis, where God breathed into Adam uh, the, the, and inspirited him, his breath, his spirit. Uh, and the same thing at, at Pentecost. God is doing again uh, what, what he did in the beginning, and we marred his creation. And then that fire represented the presence of God. Uh, and so at Pentecost, we were reminded that God is with us, always. Amen? Amen. That he is always with us, and so there's a the fire. And then, uh, you know, the gift of, of languages and, and witness and, and work and all that, that goes with that, this indwelling God that gives us life uh, and gives us mission in, in the world. And so we, uh, we kind of started this new thing. I don't know if we have started it. I've started this new thing where I'm giving you a memory verse, okay? Uh, and so uh, this is the one we're kind of working on uh, today. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and then you will be my witnesses. The words of Jesus before Pentecost. So let's say this together. You will re- Yeah, Acts 1, 8, so you kind of know where you've been. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses, Acts 1, 8. And so we're going to start all of them uh, with that. Uh, so the last Sunday was kind of the, the getting us into the topic, and so this Sunday and the Sundays that follow, we're going to talk a little more about the practical uh, kinds of parts of the, of the life of the Spirit in us. So this morning we want to talk about following uh, the Spirit, how to, how to listen for God's voice. Uh, and, and I will tell you, I've walked with the Lord a long time, since I was a small child, uh, and my family for generations before that. And this is always a little bit of a struggle. It's always like, how do I know what God wants? If we could just get God on email, right? And every morning he could send to me the agenda for the day. I want you to do this and this and this. And there are going to be these interruptions, but don't worry, I've got it handled. And this person is going to ask this question, and here's the answer, you know? I would really like that. You're all laughing at me, you know. That would be so good. Anyone else want to say amen, you know, to that? Yeah, that would just be great. But have you noticed it, it doesn't work like that? <laughs> it, it just, it doesn't. And so, uh, so this morning we kind of want to talk about that, that part of it. And so here's, here's one of the things I just know for sure right off the bat. Pentecost forever changed the way God communicates with his people. He changed it. The whole, the whole system is, is completely different now, and this is super important because if you blend the two, it can get to be a little bit of a mess. So let's look back a little bit. Uh, two primary ways God communicated his will to his people before Pentecost. So we're going to look at the Old Testament now, how God uh, worked uh, in, in that. And so in order to do that, I need to kind of take you back to Moses and Egypt and the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, which is when uh, God's people kind of became God's people. It was kind of a family, Abraham and his, his kids. And now when they come out of Egypt, they, they are a people. They are God's people. There are a, a lot of people uh, involved in this. And so you remember they go through the trials with Pharaoh and all of that. Uh, and then they get to the mountain. Uh, and this is the mountain where God gives them the Ten Commandments. And it's not email, it's in stone, all right? So that's as, as strong as you can possibly get it in those days. And that's kind of what we think about when we think about that story. What most people forget is that before Moses went up the mountain, God spoke to them directly, and it scared them. And they didn't want to get close to him. And they, they moved away from God, and they said, no, 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 we don't want this. We want someone else. And Moses, we want you to go up the mountain, which was basically to say, if God's going to strike somebody dead, better you than us, you know. That's just kind of the way they thought about that. So, so Moses, being courageous, he goes up the mountain and gets Ten Commandments and brings them down, crashes them once, has to go back up, that kind of a thing. So it's good to know that, that sometimes Moses' uh, word processor crashed too, so having lost stuff over the years with that, with that part of it. Um, and so 
he brings down to them what is the beginning of the law. Say, the law. Yeah, and when we say the word the law, we think of things probably differently than, than they did uh, in the ancient world. Um, so for instance, if I were to say to you that this week I had a brush with the law, you would assume I got in trouble in some sort of way, right? Because that's, that's, that's the way we think about that. Or we think about the law when the red lights kind of come on behind us and you're like, how fast was I going? And you automatically step off the gas and, you know, did I run a light? What ha- you know, what happened? That kind of thing. So when we refer to the idea of law, it's, it's really, for the most part, it's, it's a negative kind of thing. But for the Jews, the law was not, which is why you hear, if you read Psalms, you'll read things like, uh, the love of the law. I do not think Americans would ever say, the love of the law. That's just not the way we kind of think about it. But they would talk about the love of the law, and that's because law was different for them. Law, for them, was about wisdom about life. It was kind of God's instructions about how to live well in in this world. And it certainly had some negative parts that involved punishment, but a lot of it was about uh, how to live live in a way that that you will be successful. And when I think about this, I often think about the relationship between my dad and I. And uh, when I uh, turned 16, I got my driver's license, and I got a car. Uh, I discovered really, really quickly that cars are expensive to maintain. Does anyone else notice that, you know? That comes as a big surprise to a 16-year-old. Oh, I got to put gas in it. Oh, I got to pay for insurance. You know, it's like, oh, all this stuff. And said, my dad said, good news. I've got a way to solve that for you. It's called a job, right? And so I went and got my first job. Uh, and, and he kind of gave me some good advice, some good fatherly advice that he had been doing before that. But he said uh, some positive and some negative things. I mean, the first kind of negative thing when you think of law, he said, don't be late, Right? That's good advice if you have a job. Trust me, I was in management for a good period of time, and I can't tell you how many people I said, you have been late five days in a row. I don't think this work is for you. You would be more satisfied and happy somewhere else, right? You know, uh, and because they just they couldn't hold on to it. Another thing he said on the positive thing that really, really helped me, he said, work hard, which he had already kind of built that into me. But he, he said this that just, just amazed me. I was in the grocery business, so I'm starting out as a, as a box boy, right? You know, he said, when you get your work done, go to your boss and ask him if there's anything else you can help him with. First time I said that to my boss, I thought he was going to pass out. <laughs> what? You know, I don't think he'd ever heard that out of a box boy. But man, did that do wonders for my career. I actually broke the record for how long, for the shortest period of time as a box boy before you got moved to a stalker, right? You know, dad gave me good advice, you know, and a whole ton of advice over the years he's, he's given to me. And some of it is negative, don't do this. Some of it is positive, do this. Well, that's the way the Jews thought about it. And because of that advice, there was a lot of good things that happened to me. I had a career that took off and, and did really well. But why? Because my dad gave me the law, if you will, or maybe better, advice from a wise a father. And so basically these fall into this idea of, of avoid these things because they will damage your life, like showing up late for work. And do these things because they will give you life, like working hard and looking for extra work and trying to, to move up. So I mean, I think about that. I think all of our parents at some point have given us advice. How many of you had your parent give you advice when you're growing up about life? So, so let's just see what, what kind of stuff. Let's just shout it out. And shout it out loud because I can't hear very well. Work hard, yeah. How many of you have got that one? Some version of that at some point. Yeah, work hard, absolutely. What else? Go to college. Go to college, yep, I got that one too. In fact, my dad sacrificed so that I could go to college. He worked a lot of extra shifts for me. So, others? Stay in school. Stay in school. What was the other one? Do it right the first time. Do it right the first time, yes. <laughs> yeah, I had a boss that used to say, Say, if you don't have time to do it right the first time, you don't have time to do it twice. <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. What? Communicate. Communicate, absolutely. Learn from your mistakes. Learn from your mistakes. That is essential. Never give up. Never give up. What was the other one? Tithe first. Tithe first, absolutely. I was taught that too. Yep, my first paycheck, it was like, oh, man. <laughs> you know? So those are, you've all experienced this. So when, when they talk about the law, that's what they, they talk about is that, that wise sort of thing. So, um, so uh, the two primary things God had, oops, I should have put this up here. The first one is the law. Sorry, I got to talking and got sidetracked with that. Uh, and then the second one were the prophets. Uh, and again, when we think of prophets, sometimes 
Uh, we don't think about them kind of like they thought about them. When we think about prophets, we think about these major prophets that, that gave really kind of big sort of things and the end of the world and all that. The book of Revelation, John, who was an apostle, uh, and, and Ezekiel, by Ezekiel, and, and those sorts of things. And, and certainly there were a few that did that, but the vast majority of prophets didn't give these big prophecies about the end of the world. The primary role of a prophet was to speak for God into specific situations. Speak for God into specific situations. Very little of it involved foretelling the future, which is what we tend to think about. And so these, peop these were people that, that others would come and talk to them and say, hey, can you help me with this? What is God doing? Uh, much like a pastor's role, much like my role. In fact, you can make an argument that what is happening right now is prophecy, right? I am speaking to you specifically about a specific situation and the specifics of God's word that you can, you can apply to life. Uh, and there's all kinds of things. Moses was not only the giver of the law, but he was also a prophet himself. In fact, you'll remember God came to him in a burning bush. Amen? You remember that? You know? Again, the presence of God and, and fire. David. David bo was both a prophet. We're told he's a prophet. And he received words from a prophet when he got in trouble with Bathsheba. And the prophet came to him and said, mm, no doing that kind of thing. So, so the prophets are people that, that uh, speak for God to a specific situation. Does that make sense? Okay? And so sometimes they have these big things, but, but that's actually much rarer. So in general, the law is kind of the general principles, and the prophets are the specific situation. That's how it worked in the Old Testament. That's how God uh, did it. So at Pentecost, God put his spirit in us and now speaks to us directly. He speaks to you and he speaks to me. We don't need the law for some of that stuff. We have the Holy Spirit, right? You, you don't need the law to tell you that stealing is wrong. There's this thing called guilt. Yeah, and hopefully none of you are currently involved in this, but I remember when as a teenage boy, I did my first and only shoplifting experience. I didn't know you could feel that guilty. I was persuaded that the pastor could see into my soul and know what I had done, right, you know? And my dad too, and they're all, you know, it's just, that's the spirit of the living God in us. Uh, and we are open to the, the speaking to us directly. If you remember the, res, the, uh, the death of Christ, right? The, the, when Christ died, the, the earth shakes and the graves are open. Uh, but one of the really important ones is the curtain between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple was torn from top to bottom, which means that the Spirit did it because if you, you'd have to do it from the bottom to the top because it was tall if it were regular people. And what it did is it opened up the place of God, the Holy of Holies, to everyone. That God would now speak to his people directly. He wouldn't be shielded behind uh, laws and, and, and curtains and all of that. So this morning, where I want us to look is Galatians. If you have your Bible, Galatians 5, 16 through 25, there's a Bible in front of you if you want to look it up that way. We will also put the scripture up on, on the board. Uh, so kind of set the, set the scene here. Uh, Galatians, they've kind of been talking about the freedom we have in Christ. Aren't you glad we have freedom in Christ? You know, we are not under the law and all those little rules about what you got to eat and what you can't eat and, and all, all of that stuff. We have this freedom uh, in Christ. And so uh, he had been talking about that. And, and then what he points out is that some people were using their freedom to go wild, they were using their freedom to indulge all kinds of sins and, and, and do evil. Uh, and, and what he's going to say to us in this passage as we kind of put this together is, you are not free to sin, you are free to live for him. Okay? You are not free to sin, you are free to live for him. There's a purpose in your freedom. And it's not so that you can just blow all over the place, it's so that you can now serve Christ. And so again, another piece of advice my dad gave to me when I was growing up that I found uh, very helpful, and that was this. Freedom and responsibility are two sides of the same coin. Freedom and responsibility are two sides of the same coin. You cannot have one without the other. If you try freedom without responsibility, it's a disaster, right? In fact, there's a lot of folks today you see out there, I would like to say, I get your freedom, but you skip the responsibility part and it takes you to difficult places. And so Galatians is kind of talking uh, about that. So let me, let me start out with verse 16. It says... So I say, this is Paul, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And the word for walk in the original language is kind of the idea of a life journey. We talk about, you know, being on a journey. It's the idea of live your life by the Spirit. Make your choices by the Spirit. Listen to the Spirit. 
and you will not be, uh, glorify the desires of the flesh, okay? And flesh, when we think of flesh, we think of this, right? Our hands and the flesh on our bones, that's the way we use the language. But the original word actually didn't mean that. Instead, it meant this idea of the, the things that pull against the work of the Spirit. Uh, th- this, this is the idea, uh, uh, not of our bodies so much as those things that, that draw us back into sinful behaviors in some sort of way. And I, and I think the best way to illustrate this, if you've ever known somebody that's a recovering addict, they will often say that even years later, depending on what, the, the, what it was they were addicted to, that there'll still be a draw to that thing, you know? And they're in recovery and they're doing great. And I have a couple of friends that uh, it has literally been years, but the particular drugs they were addicted to, it never quite goes away. And they will tell you it is a daily battle for them. It's gotten better. It's gotten way, way, way better. But, but there's, a, there's a flesh, there's a part of them that, that pulls them back to that sort of thing. There's this, this struggle, you know? Uh, it, it can be all kinds of things, you know? Uh, whatever that is in your life, and everybody has those those pieces, those fleshly things that you know in your heart, that's not right, that's not where you want to be, that's not what you should be doing, but there's this pull, and, and, and we, we struggle with this. You are not to gratify the desires of your flesh, okay? So then verse 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, okay? And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, which is kind of redundant. Yes, they are. So that you are not to do whatever you want, no, 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 that can't be right. Because in America, we believe you can do whatever you want. Let's say that. You are not to do whatever you... Say that with me, okay? You... Yes. So I, I would have you turn and say this to somebody, but your kid may be sitting there, and that wouldn't be a good thing. So, um, but, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So there's this kind of this thing like, wait, wait. We're not to do what we want, but we're not under the law, which sounds like we're supposed to be able to do what we want in all of this, okay? It's a little confusing. So now he goes on and kind of gives us a list. Verse 19, the acts are the f- of the flesh are obvious, and he gives us the list. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, okay? There's something in there for everybody in that list, okay? I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's a big thing. It's an important sort of thing, that we are not, we are to not live in, in these sort of things, even though we, we have the freedom that, that comes from Christ, because these are the things that will kill us, okay? Spiritually, at the very least, and very often physically. He, there, there's this idea that, that we are not to use our, our freedom uh, in, in life to, to do those things that we, we feel drugged to, that we feel attracted to. We don't justify evil. Let me say this. We don't justify evil. <laughs> we don't justify evil. There you go. Be- because it, it, it can't, destroys us. We don't make excuses. I, I don't call out any names, but I'll be b- willing to bet that most of you have hung around somebody somewhere that justified evil and made excuses for what they were doing. That is the most painful thing to watch and to see. So then he goes on. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is interesting because crucifixion is something we think of as happening to Jesus, but now we are told to crucify something, to put to death something, and that's these passions and desires that make up uh, the the, the flesh in, in the life. And everybody has these. Everybody has these. Everybody has an area of weakness or temptation in, in, in your life in some way, shape, or another. And I'll just give you a couple of mine. Uh, I've told you before, my father was an alcoholic, a raging alcoholic at one point in his life. And he found Christ, and Christ cleaned him up and delivered him uh, from the alcoholism. In fact, it's kind of a miraculous sort of thing in his life. But we know that alcoholism runs in families. There's a genetic component to that. And I know that I have a, a, an addictive kind of personality by nature, and I probably bear the gene that was in my dad. And so in my personal life, because of my dad, it wasn't ever a guilt thing. He just talked to me about it. I have never had an alcoholic drink. And it's not because I think God's going to get me. I'm, that's Jesus drank, right? 
but it is because in my life I know there is an area of weakness in my life, and I just, I'm just giving that a really, really wide berth in my life. I don't have any trouble with anybody else, but I'm just telling you, I have to give that a wide berth in my life, okay? Another one in my life is the area of temptation is how I use words. Words is kind of how I make my living, right? So I, I, I'm pretty good with, with words, and that's the upside of it. But when I get wounded or I get angry, I don't lash out with fists. That would be stupid. I'm not big enough for that. I lash out with words. And I can cut people to the core. And it has been a constant discipline in my life that I have to be very careful about how to do it. To the point now that I work very hard that if I'm actually angry, I get quiet, not loud. Because if I get loud, it'll go off the rails, right? Now, those may not be your things at all. You have other things in your life, all sorts of things, but everybody has something in our life, and I am called to crucify those things in my life, to put them to death. Okay, now, verse 20, uh, next verse 20. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. This is the good news in, in, in all of this. We live by the Spirit, that which gives us life. And the word there, as I've told you before, in Greek is the word for spiritual life, right? That, that, that you live by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God lives in you. That was last Sunday. The Spirit of God lives in you. Okay, that is the really good news. Dwells in you, is a, is a part of you. And, and, and if that's the case, if you live by the Spirit, then let's follow the Spirit. Let's take the Spirit's leading in everything we do. Um, how many of you have been in the military at some point or other? Good, excellent. I have not. I wish in some ways I had just because there's a lot of really great illustrations that come from military. But the, the follow the spirit is a military word in, in the original language. And it's the idea of, of when you see soldiers march together, you know, the march, they follow the, the leader. Or, or maybe the idea of like when you see uh, military folks out running, you know, in a big group and they got a sergeant that's kind of calling out the cadence. Any of you do that? at some point in basic training or something like that? Yeah, several of you have. So I got a question for you guys that did that. What happens if you're going along and the sergeant's calling out that and you decide that you're not going any farther, you're just going to sit down, or you decide that you're going on a different trail? How does that go? Badly. <laughs> very, very badly, I, I, I'm guessing. And so that, that's kind of what's con here, contained here. Follow the Spirit. This is the way to life. This is the way to all that Christ has for you. The New Living Translation gives a great translation of it that I really love. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Isn't that good? Since we are living by the Spirit, you're already living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let the Spirit have control in, in everything you do. Amen? So, the Old Testament was the age of law and prophets, and in the New Testament is the age of the Spirit. Okay? So, Pentecost moves the responsibility for listening to God from others to us. And there's a part of us that likes to say, yay, we're done with the law. But here's the deal. Following the rules is easier than listening to the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Following the rules is black and white. Do this, don't do that. Listening to the Spirit, that's a little trickier for us. In fact, I am told that it is hard for some people to listen. At least that's what Jody says to me, okay? You know? Especially if I'm watching a football game or something like that, you know? How, how many of you have heard that phrase, guys? You know, you're not really good at listening, I, I, several of you being honest there. It's just, it's tough. Um, or, or maybe something along the way of, here's, here's the one, the big killer. You're not listening to me, right? And, and what she means when she says that isn't that I'm not actually hearing the words and they're not hear, hitting my eardrum, right? I need a little more hearing loss so I can say, what, dear, I'm sorry, I didn't have that turned up. Um, you know, uh, but, but it means that I'm not paying attention. I'm not, I'm not engaging uh, with her in, in, in our lives. And, and I know that we get busy and, and we get distracted and all of those sorts of things, and that's not good for your marriage. Guys, here's a little free marriage advice. Pay attention to your spouse, I would have thought the ladies would have been up in the aisles celebrating, right? This is a word from God. Here's my prof prophetic word from God. Pay attention to your spouse. <laughs> All the guys got this kind of don't look around. Don't want to see anybody. Is anybody else looking kind of thing on your faces <laughs> and all of that? 
okay? It, it's, just, it's just a part of, uh, of our lives that we learn to listen. And so we have to listen for God in the same sense that we have to learn to, to listen to one another in, in, our, in our lives, okay? Uh, and so the Spirit is the, the new way of doing it. The difficulty here is the responsibility shifts from the law to us, to pay attention in, in all that we do. And so, and so it's harder in so many ways. So uh, when I think about listening, uh, I, think, I think about this. I think Pentecost means we must actively listen for the Holy Spirit's leading in our lives. Are any of you familiar with the phrase actively listen, active listening? It's a, it's a technique that's taught in, in counseling. Um, and if you, some of you have been in premarital or those things with me, then you've, you've heard this and you should have raised your hand or you forgot what I said, but we won't go there. Um, a- a- acting li- listening is the idea of intentionally, purposely listening to one another. And I'm very thankful uh, for this early on in my life when I was in college and counseling and all of that. Uh, it's done a lot for my marriage because I got, okay, I got to stop and, and, and listen. So what active listening is, is the idea that uh, when, you're, when you're talking to each other, especially if you're in conflict, one of you gets to talk, talk and the other one has to listen. And often I will tell people, find a, a toy or something that you can hold on to, and whoever has the toy gets to talk, and the other person has to listen. And so they, they talk to them, right? And, uh, and so if Jody is saying to me, uh, da-da-da-da-da, the grass is green. Then she gets to say to me, she doesn't hand it back to me, she says to me, uh, so what did I say to you? That can be a devastating question if you weren't paying attention. <laughs> and I say something to the effect of, well, you said to me, that the beach is wet, okay? That doesn't go over well. So she gets to hold on to and talk again to me, right? Until I finally say, oh, you said the grass is green. It doesn't even matter whether I agree with her or not. It's just, are you actually listening to me, right? And then in active listening, you give it back and you go back, back and forth and those kinds of things. And so the, it is so with the Holy Spirit. You can learn skill sets to listen to the Holy Spirit better, Okay? Let me say that again. You can learn skill sets to listen to the Holy Spirit better. We don't all do it naturally well. Let me give you a little hint, dads, moms, something that the Holy Spirit gave me because, again, I'm not good at listening sometimes to things. But one, uh, with my daughter, before even Kevin came along, uh, one day we're sitting in the car, I'm taking her to gymnastics, so about a 45-minute drive, and my daughter starts talking to me, right? And I was listening to talk radio of some sort, and I turned the radio up. And immediately the Holy Spirit let me have it. <laughs> Sometimes the Holy Spirit can be very, very clear, right? And it was like, oh no. And so I reached down and I turned it down and off. And from that point forward with my children, if we're in the car and they talk, I turn the radio off. So I can listen, so I can be intentional. Can I be frank? There may be some radio stations in your life that you need to turn off so you can listen to the Holy Spirit better. You know, some things that you just need to get, get out. I mean, uh, one of the things, especially when we had all this conflict, I told a lot of you, stop watching the news, right? It's not the spirit of the living God. I don't care which side you're on, stop watching the news because it divides us and it makes us angst and all this kind of stuff that's going on in our lives. And then it's hard for us to heal the whole, hear the Holy Spirit for us, and that's a disaster. So, um, the... Uh, So Jesus listened to the Holy Spirit as well. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So here's the deal. If Jesus had to listen to the Holy Spirit, you sure do too, amen? It's it's a part of what... And in this case, he's taking him into the Spirit for 40 days of temptation and no food. Yeah, so whatever the Holy Spirit says to you, it's better than this. It's better than this. I'm just, just, just telling you, okay? Um... Uh, Pentecost means we actively listen, okay? And then um, how to listen to the Holy Spirit in your life. So I want to give you some practical kinds of things as we, we get a little closer here uh, on, the, on, on how to do this. And some of this is uh, scripture kind of stuff. Some of this is stuff just having walked with the Lord a long time, uh, I have learned o- over time. So the first thing uh, is kind of to help us. The Bible communicates the boundaries within which the Holy Spirit will speak, okay? So um, sometimes people think the Holy Spirit has said stuff to them that clearly that's not the case. You know, depending on how mystical you are, you know, some of you are good at receiving that kind of stuff. But there is this sense, the scripture tells us to test the spirits. Well, how do we test the spirits? We test the spirits against the Bible. It, it's the parameters, it's the, the fences. And, and 
you know, you'd think, oh, well, well, that's easy, but I've told you this before. Uh, a long time ago, in a land far, far away from this place, not in this church, I had a man come in one time and sit in the chair in front of my desk and say to me, the Holy Spirit told me it's okay to have an affair with a married, ma married wife, a married woman. And I said, nope, that wasn't the Holy Spirit. And he said to me, don't you have to pray about it? I said, nope, I don't have to pray about it. Why? Because the Bible communicates the boundaries within which the Holy Spirit will work. If you think the Holy Spirit is tell telling you to steal something, that's not the Holy Spirit. Okay? I can just tell you that. And if you think the Holy Spirit is telling you to punch somebody in the nose, that's not the Holy Spirit. Okay? We're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit next Sunday. That'll be fun. <laughs> So the Holy Spirit pr provides the, the, the boundaries uh, around which we work. And so um, flesh is, uh, is those things that work at cross purposes to the will of God for you. So what that guy was talking about was the flesh. He'd given in to the flesh in his life. Okay? The Holy Spirit il uh, illuminates the Bible. Here's the really cool thing about the Holy Spirit. And this gets into biblical inspiration and how we understand that. But there's something about the Holy Spirit that, that brings Scripture to life. To illuminate, I like the word illuminate. Say illuminate. illuminate. Isn't that fun to say? You know, it just means cast light on. But hey, but illuminate is funner. So, you know, you have a flashlight and you're someplace dark. You turn it on and you can see things you didn't otherwise see, right? So if you're out in the woods, that might not be a good thing. You know, you turn it on, there's a bear. Oh, hey, uh, you know. Um, so illuminate the Scripture. And, and the way this has worked in my life many, many times is, Obviously, because of my profession, I have read through the whole Bible many times. Uh, and, but every once in a while, I'll be reading through the Bible, and I'll come to a verse I've read a thousand times, and all of a sudden, it comes to life. The Holy Spirit reaches up through the Bible, grabs me by the throat, and shakes me around a little bit, right? And it's like, well, what? How come I've saw it all these other times? Da, 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 da. Well, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses God's Word to speak to our heart in supernatural kinds of ways. I often see this in terms of comfort. When people are facing grief and loss and those sorts of things, and they will say, I was kind of just reading through my Bible, and all of a sudden this passage, and man, it just spoke to me, Pastor, like, oh, it's never done before. Hey, have you ever seen that happen? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen that happen a lot, right? The Spirit just does. And then this verse all of a sudden becomes your favorite verse ever. That's the Holy Spirit uh, at work in, in our lives. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit speaks to us in prayer. In fact, the purpose of prayer is not for you to get God on your agenda, but for God to get you on his agenda. Amen? That, that's what it is. And so when, when we come to this, we often when I come to prayer, especially if there's a lot of angst going on, I unload on God. I'm saying, there's this and this and this, and I think you did this wrong, and why is this bad thing happening to this person, and that, and that, and that. I probably complain about to God more than all of you, because I think that's healthy, because a relationship is parent-child. You ever had that time when your child has a trauma in their life, you know? It's like, oh, it's so terrible, and Johnny did this to me, and it wasn't fair, and then the teacher did that to me, and it wasn't fair, and it's awful, and the whole world hates me. Guess I'll go eat worms, you know? Y'all been there? Y'all kid kids like that? Am I the only one that had kids like that? Okay, all <laughs> kids like that, you know? And what do you do? You sit there and listen. And then they get kind of done, and it clears up, and you say, well, let's talk about this. So what did you do before this? nothing really well <laughs> you know and so it is with god he lets us kind of blow off steam with him you know and then he begins to speak to us just like you begin to speak to your child in that moment and and try and help them understand and so uh the holy spirit communicates to us uh in prayer and then um the holy spirit speaks sideways we've talked about sideways grace the grace that we give one another. god gives us grace and we give grace to one another amen that's a core value for us, sideways grace. Well, the Holy Spirit also speaks sideways. He speaks to us through the people that are around us, through people uh, that are wise, through, through pastors, through friends and people that, that, that love us in, in so many ways, the, the wise counselors. In fact, let me just give you a piece of advice because I've seen this go off the rails a couple of times. If you, there's something in your life you want to do, right? It's, I got to do this. And when you talk to all of your friends, everyone who knows you and everyone who loves you says, don't do that. You know what you should do? Don't do that, right? Because you may have lost your perspective. That's the, the power of that. In fact, there's a, a Bible verse that, that speaks to this very idea. It says, where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in the abundance of counselors, there is victory. 
And this is Proverbs. This is wisdom kind of, kind of religion. So the Holy Spirit speaks to us through one another. So if you're facing something big and you really need clarity from the Lord, one of the things you can do, talk to the people that love you. Talk to the people that, that have some sort of skill set. Come to the pastor. Talk to the people that have been mentors and all of those guides uh, in, in, your, in your life. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to our spirit. And this is kind of the direct vertical thing where, where God speaks to us. Uh, and and, and the, this, the wonderful thing of this is it's so personal because the Bible is not. I have been all the way through the Bible many times and the words Craig Laughlin do not appear anywhere in the Bible. I've checked, neither in Hebrew nor in Greek. There's just, it's not in there, right? <laughs> Every once in a while, the Holy Spirit has a very personal kind of message for us, a very uh, direction that he wants us to go. And where this has normally worked in my life is what I call pressure, where the Holy Spirit begins to pressure me and push, and I feel like, oh, I should do this. And I, you know. The first time this ever happened to me in a big way was when we were uh, in Nampa. Uh, Jody and I had graduated from college. Our careers were going great. Uh, we had bought a house. We had our first kid. Uh, we had two car payments. We had a, a church that we loved. There was a whole bunch of young adults our age. We were all having babies together. And I, I can remember thinking, I would like to spend the rest of my life in, in this, this group of friends and, and in this place. And after a number of years, I began to feel the pressure from the Holy Spirit that he's making a change. And pretty soon it became clear that he was saying to me, you remember when I told you to stop preparing for ministry? Well, it, it's time to start, and I want you to go to seminary. And you got to remember, I'm in Nampa, Idaho, and seminary is in Kansas City, Missouri. The only reason there's even a town called Kansas City, Missouri, is the wagon train broke down in that place, okay? <laughs> it's, it's the only reason that's there, you know? But the pressure continued and continued, and so the Lord and I fought for about a year. And then finally, the Lord just said, I want you to go to school. And I had to pick up everything of Beverly Hillbillies across the country to get to Kansas City. But it was a message just for me. He wasn't calling anybody else in that church to go to seminary. It was just for me. And there was a pressure that builds and builds. And the Holy Spirit is always patient. It wasn't the first time he said it. He didn't say, either get on the boat or you're out, kid. He just kept pressuring me and pressing me. Gentle but firm is how I describe this. So... As we get, wrap it up here, um, when you play tug of war with the Holy Spirit, even if you win, you lose. In fact, especially if you win, you lose. Because you see, God is guiding your life for your best interest. Your best life is found in following the Spirit of the living God, of, of being what He would have you to be, of doing what He wants you to do in, in all of this. You want the Spirit to lead you. And so when we play tug of war with God, there is no winning that. And this is from a guy that's played tug of war with God many times. But what you want is God to win. So this morning I want to encourage you, let the Spirit of God have control. Follow him. In fact, Zechariah, one of my favorite verses, not by might, nor by power. Boy, that's what we do, might and power, right? You know, I'm going to win but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And this is the Old Testament. Even then they recognize this. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So let me ask you as we get ready to close, if our musicians would come, what is the Lord saying to you this morning? What, what is the spirit of God saying to you? Because the Spirit of God is here. He said he'd be here wherever two or three are gathered, and even I can tell there's more than three here. The Spirit of God is speaking and moving. Or let me put maybe a finer point on it. What do you think Jesus wants you to do? And can I just suggest to you that it may be that there's already something rolling around in your mind where you've been playing tug-of-war with God. There's some place where you're going, I don't want to go there. I don't, I don't want to make that change. I don't, you know... <laughs> Would you let God have control? Your best life is on the other side of the spirit control. Let him rule and reign in you. Maybe it means you have to do something you don't want to do. Maybe you've got to forgive somebody. Oh, man, that's hard. Maybe there's something you need to go back and make right in your life. I, I don't know, but I do know this, that when the spirit controls, there's life. Not by strength, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing in just a minute. I would invite you
if you, if you don't, just close your eyes maybe and, and talk to the Lord and let the Spirit take control this morning and let Him lead and guide your life. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for your word that challenges us. Thank you, God, that you uh, call us to, to live in the power of the Spirit, Father, that you call us to let go. And, and Father, I, I confess it's hard sometimes. Sometimes it's hard to really hear what you're saying. Lord, give us clarity. But even more than that, Father, when we have clarity, give us courage to do what you would have us to do, that we might be your people, that we might live the lives you would have us live, Father, and that your will and your kingdom might come in this place. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.